Um, I'm here with Thomas Gleixner, Jan Kishka, Martin Koning, uh, Stefan Evers, and Guy Lenardi. And we're here to talk, have a good discussion today about what's happening with industrial Linux and what we're seeing emerging for beyond 2022. Um, industrial Linux has become uh, more and more popular. Well, it, we're seeing more and more applications using it these days. And there's a lot of special concerns associated with it since it, a large case, interacts with um, you know, time domains, interacts with people, um, and there's, you know, various ways we want to make sure that we have a sound uh, ecosystem, and there's various concerns about working with Linux in this space, so the, pur the purpose for today is just to talk about it a bit. Um, my name is Kate Stewart, I'm with the Linux Foundation, and I've been involved with the Real-Time Linux Project, as well as other uh, embedded uh, projects here at the Foundation, and then with me is... Um, Jan, uh, you want to take it all away, Jan, and uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Kate. My name is Jan Kiska. I'm working for Siemens Technology uh, in what we call uh, ourselves the Competence Center for Better Linux, uh, which exists for quite a while. Uh, so it's uh, in this long-running industrial business, also a long-running uh, group that uh, we, are, we are used to support our business units in getting Linux into products. And if you are uh, riding a train, uh, which has some Siemens equipment inside it, for example, or if you are in the unlucky situation to go to a hospital and have to uh, do an MRT, a scan, uh, you will face uh, Linux in these products. And there are many, many more cases. Um, and yeah, I'm very thrilled always to see how many cases there are and how Linux is growing in this field. And that's what we try to enable. And obviously also that we try to enable in the communities uh, to make this uh, more sustainable and even better in the future. Um, Martin, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi. My name is Martin Koning. I work in the Wind River Technology Office on edge device software. I've worked as a software developer for the last 30 years at the firmware and OS level. And I started my career in telecom working on OSs for rack mount net networking equipment, things like uh, frame cell switches. Um, let's see, then a colleague and I, uh, we founded a company writing OSs for DSPs. I was acquired by Wind River. I've been there for the last 20 years. So my primary development environment has been Linux since 1997. I've watched Linux become increasingly relevant in embedded systems since then. And within embedded, Linux started being used in networking and consumer and it's continued its journey into aerospace and defense. To the point now that pretty much any device that can run Linux will run Linux um, for some, if not all use cases. Uh, in fact, due to the modern hard, um, hardware complexity level, Linux is now more than ever, not just one OS choice, it's increasingly the only choice. And so I believe that open source and Linux will always win in the end. And that includes for most real time and many safety related use cases across all markets. So on that note, I am happy to see the real-time patches for Linux now merged in the 5.15 kernel. And I wanna congratulate Thomas and others who worked on this for many, many years. Well, I guess that segues us over to Thomas <laughs> quite nicely. <laughs> Thomas, you wanna introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm Thomas Gleichner. Uh, I have background in electrical engineering and was doing automation, hardware and firmware development for many years. Before I actually uh, jumped on the Linux train in uh, 1999, uh, I was following Linux uh, since the very beginning as a hobby, just out of, the, out of curiosity because I wanted to know how an operating system works because in the classic embedded space you had a operating system, which was uh, a timer interrupt and the main program loop. That's all, it's great, it works. Um, so, but in 1999, uh, I actually decided to go uh, to its uh, Linux consulting business uh, because I was envisioning that Linux will uh, be a big player in the embedded and the industrial space. A lot of people called me crazy back then but uh, it seems my prediction has pre was pretty much on the point. So one of the things I, I noticed because I came out of the uh, automation and motion control area was the lack of real time. So was, I was looking into that and I'm involved in real time development for Linux for more than 20 years now. And yes, uh, 
we made a major step forward with the with the current merge window. We basically cut the remaining patches exactly in half, which is uh, nice to see. And um, of course, I've seen a lot of the the technologies emerging over the over the last couple of years, and I'm um, involved in many of these interesting endeavors like running uh, preempt RT in virtual machines and now the the new upcoming technologies like the uh, time sensitive networking which is going to to hit the industry sooner than later and that's all going to going more complex than before and that's one of the reasons why uh, really collaborating and uh, fully leveraging the, the open source potential is, in my opinion, the only real choice for the industry. Excellent. And then I guess, um, Stefan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. So my name is Stefan Evers. I'm working for Bosch IO. That's a subsidiary of old Bosch GmbH. And I'm working most of my time as an Bosch internal consultant in one project or the other. One of the projects that I'm working for right now that is a really exciting one is like uh, trying to find out where Bosch has should go in the future in considering uh, Linux. Uh, because what we, we one of the part, part of that was actually to we try to find out so how much are we going to use Linux in the near future, actually? And it turned out that uh, we, uh, we will roughly uh, produce around 50 million devices per year uh, that are based on Linux in 2025. That's like a rough estimation. It might be more, it might be a little bit less. But uh, that already like, uh, shows that like, Linux is an important topic for us. And um, so we have many, many different projects inside Bosch uh, around Linux. And, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting landscape to say it like this. And uh, so we are looking for ways to make it better and also make it more, let's say, um, together with, with the open source community. Me personally, I've been working in the open source space one way or the other for the last 20 years. And uh, it's an interesting and uh, um, prospering field. And uh, it's also very interesting for Bosch. And so, so we are trying to learn as Bosch and we are trying to find out what can we do. We are working together with many, many uh, suppliers that are much more, let's say, uh, deeper into these communities and into the community work. So we are to a large extent so far doing that more in, indirect. And uh, we're also looking now for opportunities where we can maybe get engaged more by ourselves. And that is like uh, something that we are looking for. On the other hand, we are also really interested that in many of these um, achievements that, are, that have been done in the last years, that they are doing, getting much more towards, let's say, to, to the upstream, because that's the problem that we are seeing, that uh, sometimes things are staying local. And uh, besides from that, it's, uh, yeah, it's for us, it has been a an interesting time because uh, more and more devices are getting connected. And when devices are getting connected, this is changing the game. And uh, so like things that we have done in a certain way in the past uh, need to change. And that's so I think that's true for the entire industry, what I'm describing here. Uh, nearly everything. I think many other companies would say the same thing uh, one way or the other. And uh, so it's interesting times and it's, uh, I think, time to improve many things. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Guy, where's, where, where, what's your perspective here? Hi, Kate. Um, I think like everybody else, I think I've been working on open source a little longer than I'd like to admit. Um, the the transition that I felt was really interesting for me personally it was about 10, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, roughly, uh, moving from the enterprise Linux space into more of the embedded one and then seeing the differences in how, for many reasons, the, the enterprise vendors, I'm thinking in particular of the likes of Red Hat and Suze, where I spent many years, 
um, were operating with Linux and their deliverables and their services to their customers and how it seemed that all the industrial adopters of Linux were underserved by either their internal teams or their suppliers. Um, and so the journey for me has been to try and take as modestly as I could some of the learnings from the enterprise vendors and the people that have been providing long-term support and, and a different experience around their deliverables and, and, and some of the other ways of, of doing things and bringing that in. Um, very recent developments have shown that even those vendors now are expressing very strong interests in working directly with the embedded devices and the IoTs and the edge and, and things like that. So. Um, it, it will be a very interesting next few years to see how the commercial availability of supported long-term available software deliverables around Linux will be shaping up. The complexity is always growing. Like Steven said, everything is now connected. Doesn't matter how small or fragile that might be. And um, so um, that's what I'm really looking forward to. Um, there's been some great developments. There are some amazing milestones coming up in the near future as well. So looking forward to discuss what uh, next year and, and the next few will, will be bringing here. Well, I think with that, then let's start digging into one of those points you raised, which was long-term support. Um, you know, um, in the industrial space, when um, devices get deployed, they may stay in production and use for, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. More. Um, so one of the questions is, you know, how long do we keep having the back ports and the kernel supporting the kernel? Um, what's actually really practical? Uh, what's efficient? What needs to change? And I guess I'll turn that one right over to Jan, since I know he cares about this area a lot. <laughs> and we can start the discussion there and keep going from here. Oops, I can't hear you. Sorry. Hi. There okay, uh, <laughs> now it works. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, actually, since uh, the beginning of this month, I'm now dealing also with the CIP kernel directly. Um, the Civil Infrastructure Platform Project was founded uh, five years ago uh, to, well, not only, but also enable long-term support um, for the industrial space of Linux-based systems. And one of our uh, cornerstone is the CIP kernel. Um, which is uh, basically an LTS kernel, a little bit longer maintained. Well, by the time we started, it was uh, eight years longer maintained, the promise, than the current, uh, the, back then, the promise of the LTS kernel, which was two years. By now, it's only the four years. Um, and in addition, we do also, or we accept also upstream merged uh, backports for enabling uh, newer boards in existing um, LTS, this says CIP kernels. So why are we doing this? Um, well, the reason is simply that, as Kate already said, the products live very long and they also take a while to be developed. Um, so the product development time starts, uh, well, one year, two years, three years is not unusual. So you already are in, in a range where, well, you should ideally, but normally you don't update on a daily basis the kernel until you release. So you usually freeze earlier. So you lose a little bit of maintenance time that way. And then the product has to live, um, yeah, for decades. I mean, the longest products we are shipping, they live for 60 years, um, for example, in the railway domain, but also in, in uh, plant, power plant uh, domains. So um, obviously the devices, at least those which are built today, I mean, the old uh, electrical relays, they lived actually 50 years unmodified. Um, the new electronic devices don't live that long. They have to be replaced over that time with newer designs, redesigns, but functionally equivalent. And the same applies to software. Um, then the challenge is obviously how to how to get the software feature equivalent and uh, functional equivalent into the field. Um, ideally, by always testing the latest version and being ready to ship the latest version uh, without seeing any difference from the customer side. Practically, that is not working yet very well. Um, sometimes working, but not that often. And that's basically where the demand or the desire for longer support comes from. I mean, it's not unusual. We mentioned the enterprise domain. We have similar patterns there. Theoretically, people could update every other year. Uh, practically, they don't do. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. And that's a similar situation we have in industry. Um, there are good reasons, like certification processes, which is a lot of paperwork. Um, that take a long time. That is a lot of a uh, lot of costs that you don't do unneededly, uh, repeatedly. If you can argue that the delta is smaller, 
we probably have an argumentation about what is the delta. But anyway, um, that's the situation. Interfaces uh, in the kernel are important to stay because in the ideal world, everything's upstream. In the real world, not everything is upstream. We could also talk about this probably, we should. And that's basically a driver for us um, to have a longer support kernel. And the same actually also for user space components. That's uh, the other story because the kernel alone doesn't make a support, system. What's the actual support time you're uh, aiming for? right now so we are aiming for 10 years at the current stage um that is catering the current demand i mean some users are happy with five years actually um some actually would would love to see 20 years because this is how long the, the product actually physically have to be replaced in the field and, and it's a long time don't want to touch their own software stacks on top um the compromise is the 10 years and well we say it's a promise for the existing kernel um I wouldn't predict that this is exactly the same number we will have to ship maybe in five years from now, because maybe the demand is shifting. And if only very few users remain at one to 10 years and are happy with, with six years or five years, um, then possibly we will focus on other things. I mean, uh, the project is uh, agile enough to do other things as well if this is no longer the demand, but this is the current situation. Uh, I mean, the question is how do we get to, to a point where we make the, the industry agree on something useful like four or five years, which is mm -hmm. reasonable. Right. Because one thing, if you look at, I mean, the, 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 my main example for why this model can't work is the whole hardware vulnerability uh, uh, problem we had a couple of years ago with Melter Spectrum. If you look at, uh, we, we were able to backport for three sta long-term stables easily. Some of and it. Then, and, and then all hell break loose. Mm -hmm. So this was, a, uh, I mean, uh, aside, aside of the fact that uh, uh, the handling of the whole uh, uh, problem was more than uh, suboptimal, that's a, that's a different, uh, different issue. But all, on the technology side, if you really run into a situation where you have to backport that complex stuff, it's going to be a train wreck no matter what. It doesn't work. And it, that it, the other downside is this whole backporting business is uh, uh, binding so much talented uh, engineer capacity which we, we really would have better uh, uh, available for, for other things. So the goal has to be to shorten these LTS frames to make people aware of that moving ahead is, is smarter because the delta you carry with your vendor patches or your, your particular driver, which isn't yet upstream, uh, is usually less critical and less dangerous than backporting the whole big thing. There's another issue we had that couple couple of times. You find someone finds a a, a bug. Uh, some researchers find a find a bug in an in an, a recent LTS kernel. So we fix it, and then we look at the backports, and then we figure out oh, uh, three years ago, no, this doesn't apply. And actually, yeah, the code was rewritten. The problem didn't exist back then. Exactly that problem didn't exist, but five lines down, it existed in a different way, exactly the same thing. So those, those issues happened over and over. And one problem here is uh, that uh, if you look at the focus, what the, what the security researchers and the penetration testers do, they focus on the relatively new kernels. They do not go back and test your 20 year or 10 year old trunk kernel. They won't do that. And because they, they have not enough capacity either. So we have a shortage on, on engineering capacity on all ends, but then we divert it into, oh yeah, let's backport it forever, create total horror kernels, which are undebuggable and which are very, very special, very narrow which means they do not get the, the wide exposure in testing and all these other things we have uh, around. That's my main concern. So the focus must, even if we can't 
convince people right now, but we really have to work on pushing them into the direction, move along with your, with your thing. And if you do that collaboratively, then even the, the, the certification angle will be slightly less problematic because if people do that together, you have the effect of it's a shared problem. It, it's actually, oh, yeah. it's, it's pretty complicated um, because sometimes when you push somebody to a newer version of the software, and especially when we talk about vulnerabilities, you, um, you may be updating them to a software um, payload that has more vul vulnerabilities than the one that they were on because the latest versions don't always, you know, get better with respect to vulnerabilities. And so you really have to understand um, what, what you're moving to and whether it's actually better because you may have validated and secured with a, within a really tight context. And, and so sometimes putting a box around things is also an interesting option. Um, although I totally agree that you need to be able to update and stay current to um, close certain problems like the ones you just um, discussed in hardware. Sometimes for software, uh, there's also tension to not do that, right? Or pressure to not do that. But, but I recommend you to read Keith Cook's blog uh, about that topic, which he published recently. It's a really interesting read. And he points out why this, uh, this is the, exactly that. Oh, the new kernel is going to be more vulnerable than the old kernel is just a bullshit argument, really. Yeah, no, I'm it not is. saying it is. I'm saying because that because we are we're, we're we're may more may more focused on 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 security uh, issues right now than we ever were. That means yes. the new year kernel is the more uh, the more mitigations for for classes of of attacks it has. The more uh, the more testing, the more uh, research effort goes into those kernels, which all the kernels never will get that attention again. Yeah. It, it Unfortunately, that argument comes up time and time again. And in these really big industrial companies, you have layers of people, security officers, then centralized group, then the open source expertise, and they have internal suppliers that work with external suppliers that are the interface to the BSP vendors for the SOCs. And by the time you do all that, you get into months worth of timelines for procurement and purchasing and validations. and and so now, just this week, I had a customer ecstatic about the fact that they're going to be able to move to 4.19. I'm like, this yeah, is really, ridiculous. Really. Like, this is not sustainable. <laughs> and that's exactly the point that Thomas is making. Like, by having these trickle effects of these little fears or these little commercial arguments that are being raised by vendors here and there, sometimes not of their own fault, sometimes because their own internal validations are huge. And we're thinking of a little bit containerization over here, a virtual machine over there, an hypervisor that hides some complexity over here, and things will be fine. Things are not fine when in 2021, September, an industrial vendor that has hundreds of thousands of developers and people and infrastructure lawyers tell you that they're moving to a kernel that was released three and a half years ago, that's gonna end of life upstream in a year or so. That's the problem. Yeah. And, and that's what we need to change. It's all about trust, right? It comes down to understanding the provenance of the software, not just in the kernel, but in all of the code in the system. And being able to track that uh, really helps and uh, allay those fears, so people will be receptive to to getting an update, you know, through the software chain. Yeah. So yeah, but, but you that. have to you have to change the mindsets in the in the companies. I mean, I was talking to to quality assurance people recently in a larger company. They basically told me, "No, you can't change the version number, but we can oh, yeah, yeah. apply a gazillion of patches to that kernel." <laughs> Unless, yeah. So I said, okay, problem is solved. I move you to the latest kernel and, and, and patch the version, the version number back to that old kernel. They, they we had that conversation on the enterprise Linux side. We were they saying didn't that. Have that a problem. They didn't have a problem with that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Because they say if you don't change the version number, you don't have to recertify, every, you retest everything. What? If you change massive piles of code in, 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 the central, uh, in the center of the OS, you definitely want to retest everything. We, we, Actually, so here we come to an, interesting, to an interesting topic that is, uh, I think, uh, also really important to understand. Like uh, coming from the different hardware like providers that are bringing in pieces, for example, for a certain device, 
uh, you get a lot of things along, uh, like patches that, that you're supposed to put in. And uh, many of these things, for example, are not upstream. And it, I think the demand inside uh, different companies and the understanding that this should be actually going upstream is like another big problem. So at the end of the day, so many yeah. things are really heavily patched that I agree that, that this is uh, actually it, in maybe introducing a lot of problems in particular according to the entire maintenance uh, over time thing. Because uh, when all these patches and all these things are coming in, and this is not only, for example, a vendor it gives you something like a board support package that uh, there's not only the, his specific drivers in there, but there's a lot of other stuff in there that is not necessarily exactly only for running this. So then getting this upgraded somehow is typically a nightmare. And maybe the corresponding vendor is no longer interested in providing, for example, for the next version or something. So uh, yeah. this is if like another upgrade, argument when, when, why we would love is, to see yeah. more and more this is a daily fight for us mainline well. yeah. upstream. Yeah, yeah. And there's a huge, huge challenge understanding what is in your system. Also, if you don't have, you know, a complete software bill of materials and understand the versions and of, of all the code that's feeding into your system, right. uh, then you can have a trust issue uh, as well, right? With doing like uh, an open update to the latest versions, uh, you don't know really how many levels you're jumping. So, you know, the partitioning of software and the understandability of the bill of materials, I think. Those are really important aspects to this conversation because if you can separate out things and manage risk with a perimeter, and you know Thomas mentioned the kernel, but this the, you might have multiple kernels in your in your complex, you know heterogeneous multi-core SOC, that, then uh, then you can make these decisions sort of somewhat independently depending on how mission critical a particular OS instance is. You know whether it's in a container or it's in a virtual machine or it's on a compute island. You know the partitioning will really, can can help us uh, there. Right? Yeah, there's a there's a topic that I think Jan can speak to much better than I can. Uh, some of our North America based healthcare sir, hardware providers have industry mandated things that say, for example, any software that requires two hundred and fifty thousand hours of testing. That's just something that's written in their QA standards, etc. So. There's a reticence in being able to do some changes. You can parallelize that, of course, but there's only a limit to how many things you can run overnight for month and, and, and so on to be able to do that. So there's a challenge around some of the regulatory compliance around quality assurance requirements and some of those very long-term extended processes that you go through. I think healthcare, Jan, is a good example of that where they have pretty rigorous test cycles sometimes. Yeah, it depends. Um, it depends on 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 the on the market uh, you are in. So actually, I'm I'm not an expert on the certification exact rules for the healthcare market. Uh, we got to touch a little bit on on the railway domain and an industrial domain. Um, and yeah, sometimes these. I mean, if you look at this today, the the regulation is in conflict. Um, if you look at, for example, the railway domain, they demand obviously a safety certification for your device. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the kernel itself and all the stuff has to be certified, but the function of the device. At the same time, by now, for good reasons, they demand a software update concept. So you are already in the conflict that you need to do updating on a regular basis while you have to certify the safety function at the same time. Um, that is so far still solvable with a certain uh, approaches and certain um, yeah, uh, complexity management. Um, but this is growing, I think, over the top. And I think there's also some movement in this domain to realize, OK, we have to find different ways to achieve one or the other goal. Um, and definitely, I mean, it all boils down, as mentioned before, or not, not only, but it's a key important thing to have a better confidence in the test results that we uh, produce um, for the version we ship, not only, but also for the version we could ship the other day. And that is a key element uh, to drive that forward. And uh, whenever I talk about long-term support, I would also like to talk about it, obviously, by investing into long-term support, um, we also invest into testing. We are not the only ones. We are not the one who invented this, uh, but we also contribute to this. We have to. It's a key element. And if we improve this uh, even better than the uh, support of the LTS, uh, we can get rid of the LTS by just having a perfect test coverage in the ideal world and having a quicker confidence in the results um, of a newer version. On the other hand, and this is also what I have to emphasize, uh, we're looking ahead, we're looking for the perfect world, but look, at, look into the reality today, 
what are we mitigating? The situation today is mentioned before, the vendor kernels uh, maybe enriched by some uh, integrator kernels or integrator extension to this by your own extension to this. And that obviously maintained per product, uh, per developer um, in their spare time, uh, exaggerated. I mean, obviously there are maintenance programs, but the reality is that too many of these activities happen in parallel, um, not to the optimal quality, not to the optimal result. So the first logical step is to consolidate. Wherever there is a demand for reasons or good or bad ones, let's at least provide them an option which is uh, consolidated as much as possible. And also for vendors who want to consolidate on these activities. And I think everyone is by now from the Silicon world is providing LSP, uh, LST based, uh, long-term support based uh, boss support packages, at least uh, in the past that was random. And the next step would logically be to have them um, on board and, and getting them uh, via the upstream path, like we demand um, via CIP by now. You, you haven't mentioned the fact that a lot, that chain, a lot of those violate the spirit of the GPL v2 license of the kernel. Some of those components are only available in proprietary form for the vendors and never available to the final customer. And all of that affects the quality and the security of, of those kernels for, for the final product. The fact that we're now yeah, starting obviously. to see the uh, software, basically a, a strong push for the software transparency and having the SBOMs available and visible will make some of that much more explicit, I think, yeah. which will make it easier to start tackling some of these types of issues. I think that's one of the changes that's emerging now that is going to probably sway some things. In fact, uh, Open Embedded, for instance, has just managed to get um, uh, the automatic generation of software bill of materials happening. I'm hoping that other places, other distros will be doing that as well. Um, right. And so that we can start to get this type of transparency of when there's patches, things like that, that are included. Um, it's more than just a version. I kind of think we also need to potentially get down to the source level of knowing exactly which source files are making things up. But I, I think we've got to go to at least get versions first before we get yes. down to that higher. Like, you know, I still want to see a Linux kernel when we can build the Linux kernel and we've got to build materials generated for each build that takes every file that's actually in there. I think Absolutely. that will help with on the safety side. But that's my little, you know, wish list item now. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, these these things are being worked on and and they will show up in in, in the in the foreseeable future. Uh, the other thing is getting the vendors, especially the system and chip vendors and, and the IP vendors. Uh, to bring uh, their patches upstream. I mean, that's something only the customers, uh, the larger uh, uh, customers can demand. I mean, Google was very successful uh, on the Android side, at least to some extent, because they they pushed it. No, it's not perfect, but it's way better than it used to be. I think um, the Chrome OS team might have done even better than Android from that perspective. Chrome OS, yeah. is, Chrome OS is, is probably the, the prime example for it. Yes, they, they, they did a very, very good job for it. Yeah. So, and I think if the larger part of the industry, those, especially those who ship gazillion of devices per year, tell their vendors, get your act together and ship that stuff, uh, stuff upstream, then this will have an impact. Yeah. So and just to share some, some some aspect on this, Thomas, because I recently had been a discussion with one of our suppliers on that topic, uh, complaining about, while well, actually I was trying to make it positive, uh, looking for a better way to collaborate on the upstream work that they are doing and that we have to do in lockstep, in kind of lockstep. Um, and, and the feedback was, yeah, great, Jan, um, we, let's work together on this. Uh, and it turned out when we discussed the exact mode, they had to admit, yeah, actually, we would love to have a forum for our customers to discuss this. But the result is in the end, Jan, you are, as Siemens, far ahead of many of our customers in this regard. They don't demand this. So this is actually the problem. We, we, we yeah. could do more there and the vendors would do more if more users ask for that. And that is actually our uh, duty as, as, supply, as, as uh, obtainers of these uh, chips, of these yeah. IPs to always remind that and, and insist on that. Um, and this is what we are trying hard, but obviously it's a volume matter. So you have yes. to have the right volume in your backhand, which is not always the case in industrial space. I mean, True. we are shipping products sometimes in hundreds of units per year. 
Um, that is an aspect. Yes, of course. Then, we also shipping have large no as well. And, yeah, then we do have leverage also in some areas. And another silicon vendor just recently told us um, that uh, thanked us because they rethought their upstreaming strategy. They are already quite good on this. And they said, OK, with your feedback, we thought about it again. And we would like to make it really available that when the silicon is out, uh, everything is upstream. And that's why we are retiring our upstream um, well, vendor branch until that happened. And we make it a mainline tracking branch until that happened. And that was actually what we were asking for as well, because during the product development, that is what should happen. Um, and so they are shifting this. I mean, it's still a way to go, and yeah. it will take maybe another product generation to get there, but it's a step, another step forward. And another step also to use against uh, or in the favor of the argumentation with other suppliers. Another aspect to this one is that uh, we're all platform developers, and so we like the control of being able and you know being able to select and, and packages and versions and 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 pull things and create platforms. But from a user's perspective, if they're building a, a product, uh, you know they might just want a platform, a ready-made system, and and trust that someone else is worrying about the problems of the ingredients that go into that. And, and instead of us rolling up all the complexity all the time of creating platforms to to users, if we can get to a sort of a, a ready-made platform offering that can move and just work for a certain vertical and certain hardware um, and then have a trusted entity responsible for that, I think it's a good paradigm to try to shield users from this problem because it, all the complexity just always rolls, rolls right up when we have a component model rather than a platform model. And I, and I think it's because as computer scientists, we're building components and building platforms, users that are doing applications, sometimes looking down on the platform have a different perspective of what they actually want to see. Yeah, I think actually that is like uh, what we have been observing. Um, that so, so we have two things that, is, that are happening. On the one side, we have a change because of the maintenance uh, topic that is coming becoming more and more important. Like uh, everyone is getting more and more aware of, oh, there's something that's really hard to solve. And so something needs to change. So I, I, no matter who you're talking to right now in the industrial manufacturing area, uh, who is producing devices, they realize something needs to change. The problem is just how to do it. And that, that has not uh, been, let's say, uh, there's no clear path yet. So, so we were really happy when we were seeing that, the, for example, the civil infrastructure project were coming up because I think it needs more space, like community space, where uh, like these things are discussed and like uh, solved in, in, in a good way. Um, so that like, let's say these people that are doing it on a daily basis that are not there yet, not so familiar in this community work in this way of working, that they know, oh, okay, this is becoming more and more like the way how uh, things should go and that they have like an easy way, let's say, to, uh, to go follow this path because uh, we, should, we should be clear about that. But these people that are producing the devices, they are very, very busy to get uh, their start of production uh, project finished. And uh, that is like their, what takes all their energy and the closer the start of production point comes, uh, the, the, the more they're getting into this sweating position where they say, oh, we, we just need to get it done, that it's working properly. So if, if these things have not been prepared long before in beforehand, so that at this point where they have potentially a choice to go another path, this path is already, let's say, somehow has proven to be a good industrial choice, then they will not take it because it's just introducing, introducing too much risk for the start of production. So, and, and that is, uh, I think that is like the main issue, like, uh, um, we need to ha have a sp more space where these things are like somehow industrial, uh, like de facto standards, how to do it, where everyone is saying, yeah, this is a good way. I think every, every company who's, who is in this area now, they have the feeling something needs to change. We need to improve the things, but just they don't yeah. know how. And the smaller the company is or the, the let's say, the more conservative they are, the less... Uh, it's expected expected to come from them. And, and Guy, you mentioned uh, enterprise and, and I, IT um, uh, OS vendors moving into the embedded space. I think there actually are things to learn from the way they do things. 
uh, that's relevant to this conversation around the platform model and trusted, you know, and provenance and having somebody worrying about creating a platform and pushing that out. And, you know, that's that hasn't traditionally been the way we built embedded systems, right? It's been sort of see of components and, and build your own, compose your own platform. And so uh, maybe there's some key learnings there that, uh, are, that we can take. I agree. It uh, Kate, I just okay. wanted to add one quick thing on that topic that Thomas started and somehow we all managed to walk around the soapbox, but it, it should be acknowledged that the, the ARM licenses and that entire ecosystem have been in a large way getting away with murder for years, right? If we ignore the immediate small supply chain issues that potentially will resolve itself, there still are a lot of complexities out there. We hear Jan and others telling us about 15, 20 years, hardware support and all that. You can't even get a reliable end of life for an SOC from any vendor to save your life or some or anything like that. And they give you one and then it comes 18 months earlier or 25 months earlier. And then everybody does things differently. They have different bootloaders, sometimes because of Android or otherwise they're stacked up. Bare metal Linux is an illusion. It hasn't existed for five or 10 years. We all work with hypervisors, with virtualization solutions. The multiple cores, like Martin told us, that it's not just about the Cortex A's that are out there. There are other things that run on that SOCs that the products need to be compatible with and working with. And so all of that has, I think, exacerbated all these issues. So I, I of course, agree a platform is necessary. We need to acknowledge that there's all that complexity around that. So, well, yes. It's, it's, there's all these components out there that make up, a, a you know, an, there's a Linux kernel itself, but then there's all the components that make up something that you're running on top of it. And all those components each have their own different life cycles right now and their different support paths and different levels of quality associated with them. Um, so one of the things I'm wondering is the same way that the kernel has made its life cycle very transparent, should these upstream other all these other components in our open source ecosystem be, be explicit about their long their end of life and make it visible that they are out of service at this certain point in time. On the other hand, you know, there's the other side that there's things like, you know, the time utility, it's sitting there, it's been working forever, no one's been touching it, or very freely every 10 years, and you don't need to touch it that often. Right. But, you know, is, do we need to get more transparency on that aspect about the elements of the software? You know? <laughs> Actually, some I of those vendors, yeah. Okay, going ahead. I was just going to say, like, some of those vendors require five NDAs and like a month and a half before they even give you the time of day. So I think we're very far from being the, for getting the number one offenders here to be able to have a constructive conversation around that. But I'll let the industrialists talk to that. Yeah, I think we're talking about a general software management problem that's not specific to the Linux kernel, right? right. So it's yes. apply yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying- actually, well, One thing I would like to, to like add here, like, we were talking about more or less that, okay, it's, it's fine that we are on the component level. Uh, so, and uh, maybe it's uh, time to move up to a platform level, but actually like when you see it, we are actually in many, many cases, uh, we are sub components because uh, the components are getting patched in the embedded space a lot. And uh, like uh, we are also have technologies like recipes and things like that, that are actually uh, like driving that. So um, to, to optimize it, so we are actually, even the components are not like a consistent element that we're, where we know, okay, this element is, is in this device and it's, for example, then it would have this vulnerability or whatever. So that is actually something that we are trying to drive um, that, that we have at least this understanding, okay, this is this component. And th then it's also easier, for example, to look at the maintenance issues. Uh, when at least we know, okay, this is like the, we are like, like a distribution, uh, like handling, okay, this is one, this is the component and uh, it's not getting patched like 50 times uh, through, because of different reasons. We're going to need a lot Actually, not, not just data. like as a computer distribution, I would say by now, I think we are very much at the point where distributions play a major role in embedded. Um, that's also what we what we do ourselves, but also what we, what we hear from others. I mean, just recently, uh, down to sites, anyone who did it in a private conversation, he said, well, we are seeing less and less of these purpose-built embedded Linux devices. Uh, the classic way, where you fiddle with every component and, and uh, choose the right version you would like to have, but rather distributions. Rather, to a certain degree, customized, but generally taken as they are, because there's the complexity of the integration is already high enough and the maintenance effort is already high enough. Why doing it ourselves? 
Exactly. Exactly, and that is what, what I was uh, a lot of, what lot I was trying to say that this is like the, in to many in many ways the the way like at for what we what we hope for that this is like the way forward whenever it is possible. In some cases, of course, it's not because we really need to get the last uh, bite out of it. But whenever it's possible, also plan this way to just reduce the complexity because that actually also lowers the software maintenance costs dramatically. So you can invest that a little bit more in the hardware costs if you can lower the yeah, software I mean, maintenance costs in this. Yeah, I mean, every byte you no longer need to squeeze out of this, I guess. I mean, there are still some cases, uh, I guess, more on your side than on ours. Um, but yes, uh, I think at the same time, we see a trend where this squeezing, optimizing the last bit uh, is decreasing. You don't have the time anyway in your product development cycle. Um, Though it's more about fixing something or adding something. I mean, yesterday I had to patch system D, which is a nightmare, obviously, if you're building distribution based embedded systems, you have to rebuild it and you have to integrate it. it. Obviously, at the same time I was patching it, I was also trying to get it upstream. So even if it's not going to happen tomorrow, maybe it will happen for the stable phases if someone acknowledges it as a stable bug, um, or at least it happens for the next release. So this is something we have to do in our daily work, and we have to drive our engineers and, and our suppliers to, if there's a need to tune something for the better, make sure that you do it and also upstream it at the same time. Otherwise yeah, it like becomes unmaintainable. Approach. Distribution based and then also like upstreaming as far as possible. At least to the corresponding distribution when you have to change something, but uh, even better, like trying to push it up to the corresponding upstream project, for example, the kernel itself, the mainline kernel. Ideally, there first, if you can. I yeah. mean, sometimes the, the upstream says, no, you are too old, you ask your distribution. But if you can, um, and the problem is present in the latest version anyway, then do it this way. Yeah, but to be honest, that like this kind of behavior, that is changing that inside the big companies and in in like in the mass of the corresponding embedded developers takes a lot of time and that is like something it's like a cultural change and a cultural change yeah. everyone who's trying to drive change in a company cultural change is the most difficult one and the most uh, expensive one because it takes a lot of time and people convincing and things like that it's so it's difficult we we i think we have to be a little bit patient but uh, i think it's something we need to do Okay, I think we're just about out of time. So I, I'm, I think not Thomas <laughs> I'm, I'm not expecting that to change tomorrow. But yes, there is a lot of historic burden on there and there's a lot of uh, culture. Uh, yes, we are special and we need to, to hack it because uh, I see a lot of industrial kernel patches and also for other packages every other day. And most of them are done for the very wrong, wrong reason. And, and that's that's a culture thing, I know, but we have to to address that culture problem over time. Other, otherwise, we run into a situation where this gets out of control. It, it becomes unmaintainable. We just had uh, we just had a project with a customer. It take it took us two years to consolidate their kernel and root file system sue. They have actually a total of fifty different kernel versions really kernel versions plus 15 uh, 25 different root file system uh, creations out there this is unmaintainable we have one customer that has more kernel versions than employees <laughs> okay, so I think that is a very <laughs> overall theme where we need right. to be making focus on upstreaming first we need to be making figure out better ways we can simplify, make things more transparent, and um, you know figure out the distributions and get all the pieces pulling together effectively, um, and sharing some of that load uh, with the testing, also, and so that we have a better system working forward as a whole ecosystem. There's also another aspect to it. This, this, this is about emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm involved in, uh, and, and my employees are involved in uh, TSN-related activities for the last couple of years. So we see a lot of the uh, industrial players, including the system and chip vendors, everyone hacks his own special TSN or magic solution together. At the very end, we need something which is upstream, and we need something which is actually maintainable for every and solves the problem for everyone. But it's so hard to bring these people to, together and say, hey, let's do it 
let's put down the requirements what we have. Let's look at it from a technical perspective. Let's look at it from an open source uh, maintainer perspective. What the, the, the upstream people will say about this and what expectations do they have? And then let's work on it together. No, it's not happening. We're just seeing tons of horrible hacks being done for no good reason. And that's, that's Thomas, the other. good news. My internal users regarding TSN say the very same what you say. Um, so there is at least hope from the consumer perspective that we do also some pushing in that direction. So right. culture changes is needed still <laughs> for industrial Linux to be effective. And I guess on that note, I will say thank you very much to all of the panelists. It's been a fun discussion. I think we could have gone on for another hour very easily. <laughs> thank you so much, Kate. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, you. Thank, thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.